reading No Wars for Oil, No Oil for Wars. David is a 2015, 2016, and 2017 Nobel Peace Prize nominee, and he has a master's degree in philosophy from UVA. I should also say his mother, Linda Swanson, was my student here at Eastern Mennonite University many years ago. <laughs> Pete Kilner um, is a military ethicist who served more than 28 years in the Army as an infantry officer and professor at the U.S. Military Academy at West Point. He deployed multiple times to Iraq and Afghanistan between 2003 and 2011 to conduct research on combat leadership, interviewing nearly 400 soldiers at their outposts. He is the co-author of two books and more than 80 articles on ethics, military leadership, and organizational learning with an emphasis on moral justifications of killing and moral injury. He currently writes a regular column on professional ethics in Army Magazine. His writing can be accessed at soldierethicist.blogspot.com and coreethics.com. He is a graduate of West Point and the Army's Command and General Staff College, and he holds a philosophy, also, from Virginia Tech, and a PhD in education from Penn State. Pete is husband of 28 years and father of four sons, the oldest of which is a soldier currently deployed in Syria, if you read the news about Syria. And keep his son in your prayers. Um, with that, let me just explain the format briefly and also thank ACRS. I see many ACRS members here tonight. Thank you for sponsoring this event. Um, the format will be... Um, each of them will have 20 minutes to speak, then the other will um, have a three minute rebuttal, and then the person who spoke will have one minute to answer or respond. Uh, last night, they gave this talk at, where? Radford. Radford. And Pete went first last night, so tonight David is gonna go first. Um, so they're just switching. So we'll start with David, 20 minutes. Um, and then I will help moderate the conversation after that format in which um, we can engage with all of you. So thank you. Thank you uh, for that wonderful uh, beginning and for hosting and thank you all for being here. We did do this at Radford for the first time last night. This is our second try. Uh, hopefully we'll get better and better as we go along. The video of last night's is at davidswanson.org and other places. And we agreed last night, as the majority of this country has agreed for years, that military spending should be reduced. I want it gradually reduced to zero. I don't know where Pete wants it, somewhere other than zero. However, I am certain that if military spending were significantly reduced, you would see a reverse arms race and a reduction in threats and hostility abroad and consequently greater public desire to go on reducing it further. So in that sense, we don't need this debate. We just need democracy rather than wars in the name of democracy and a government that goes on moving piles of money year after year from just about everything else into the military. But to build a movement powerful enough to influence the US oligarchy, we do need this debate. We do need a clearer understanding that no war can ever be justified. And therefore, that dumping over a trillion dollars a year into preparing for a possible just war has to stop. After all, 3% of that money could end starvation on Earth. 1% could end the lack of clean water. A bigger chunk could give us a chance against climate change rather than serving as the leading cause of climate change. So it's the institution of war that kills far more than actual wars. And we can't build the strength to reduce it as long as people imagine there might be a just war someday. Pete and I also agreed that numerous wars have been unjust. I'll talk a little about why the wars he claims were just were actually unjust on their own terms and in isolation. But I think the burden for a just war is even higher than that. I think a war to do more good than harm has to do so much more good than harm as to outweigh the damage done by all the admittedly unjust wars, as well as by the diversion of funding from where it could save and improve millions of lives rather than wasting them. War is an institution, and for any war to be justified, it has to justify the damage done by the institution. But Pete only named a couple of wars 
just and a couple unjust without giving us a method that would allow us to determine which are which when we turn to all the wars he didn't label one way or the other. Those include the wars he took some part in, Afghanistan and Iraq. In 2006, Pete claimed the war on Iraq was doing Iraq lots of good. I asked him repeatedly what that good was, and I never got an answer. He did call the 2003 begun war imprudent and a mistake. If that is what you call a war that radically increases the use of the term sociocide, meaning the total destruction of a society, I wonder what level of slaughter is needed before a war gets labeled something harsher like bad or unpleasant or mildly regrettable. One current war that Pete agreed was unjust was the U.S.-Saudi war on Yemen. But will Pete join me in urging U.S. troops to refuse the immoral and illegal order to participate in that war? Isn't that a moral duty comparable to that of encouraging participation in supposedly just wars? Doesn't it expose one of the many problems with calling the U.S. military voluntary? Anything else you do that's voluntary, you're allowed to quit doing. What is the point of teaching soldiers morality if they aren't supposed to act on it? Pete will say that he has explained what a just war is. It's a war fought because you've been attacked. Except that he'll immediately admit that the United States has been fighting all these wars without having been attacked. So what he actually means is that someone else has been attacked, allowing the U.S. to step in as a gesture of generosity and assistance. But as a rule, this stepping in is not appreciated, not requested, not actually helpful, on the contrary, catastrophically counterproductive, and also, by the way, illegal. Who died and made the United States the world's policeman? Nobody. But millions of people have been killed by the policing. The publics of most countries polled in 2013 by Gallup called the United States the greatest threat to peace in the world. Pew found that viewpoint increased in 2017. To begin to grasp why, just imagine if some other country began bombing several nations at a time out of the goodness of its heart. The shrieks of rogue nation and war criminal would echo across every corporate news outlet. Imagine if some country put missiles just inside Canada and Mexico aimed at the United States the way the United States does to Russia. Imagine if they justified this as defensive and proved it by pointing out that it was being done by their defense department. There's a video of Vladimir Putin asking former U.S. Ambassador Jack Matlock about U.S. Muscle, missiles near Russia, and Matlock tells Putin not to worry because the missiles are purely a jobs program for back in the States. Would such an answer satisfy us if the case were reversed? Never mind that the studies done by the University of Massachusetts show quite clearly that military spending costs us jobs rather than adding to them. Although the one relatively recent U.S. war that Pete says was just cannot possibly outweigh the damage done by all the U.S. wars we agree were not, plus the diversion of funding, the risk of nuclear apocalypse, the war machine's environmental damage, the political and cultural damage, the counterproductive endangerment rather than protection, et cetera, et cetera. Let me look at that one war briefly. This is the Persian Gulf War. Recall that the United States had worked to bring Saddam Hussein to power and had armed and aided him in an aggressive war against Iran for years. A company called American Type Culture Collection in Manassas, Virginia, supplied the biological materials for anthrax to Saddam Hussein. Only later, when it was clear Iraq had no significant biological or chemical, much less nuclear weapons, the pretense that it had new, vast stockpiles of them was somehow a justification to bomb a nation full of human beings, 99.9% .9 of whom had never shaken hands with Donald Rumsfeld. But first came the Gulf War. Like every war, it began with a long period of threats which bore no resemblance to the immediacy and urgency of a mugging in a dark alley or similar analogy that Pete likes to use. In fact, during this particular drawn out period, a public relations company coached a girl to lie to Congress that Iraq was taking babies out of incubators. Meanwhile, Iraq proposed to withdraw from Kuwait if Israel would withdraw from Palestinian territories illegally occupied. Iraq also proposed a weapons of mass destruction free zone for the Middle East. Numerous governments and even a guy rumored to be 
infallible, goes by the name of the Pope, urged the United States to pursue a peaceful settlement. The US preferred war. At further odds with irrelevant analogies to personal self-defense, the US in this war killed tens of thousands of Iraqis while they were retreating. Do you know why recent presidents other than Trump have not proposed big military parades? It is because none of the US wars since the Gulf War have been able to even remotely pretend to a victory. My point is not that we need a victory after which we should want a parade, but rather that there is no such thing. And the Gulf War was not a victory either. And we need to recognize this basic truth before we're all turned into fire and fury. The endless bombings and sanctions. Who remembers Madeleine Albright saying that killing half a million children was justified? And the new wars, and the troops in Saudi Arabia, and the terrorism aimed at getting those troops out of Saudi Arabia. What do you think 9-11 was exactly? And the further militarization of the Middle East and the horrible illnesses among the veterans and all the other horrors that followed from the Gulf War render grotesque the notion that it was a victory or a success. Do you know what Gulf War veteran Timothy McVeigh said to excuse blowing up a building in Oklahoma City? Like a perfect just war theorist, he said that he had a higher purpose so that the building and the people killed in it were merely collateral damage. And do you know why people didn't fall for that line? Because Timothy McVeigh did not have effective control over any television networks. By the way, I do believe we should offer Donald Trump a deal, one parade for each war he ends. Pete's Pete's candidate number two for a just war is Bosnia. As every war has a Hitler, the man Tony Blair labeled Hitler this time was Slobodan Milosevic. While very, very far from an admirable leader, he was lied about. The war failed to overthrow him. The creative, nonviolent Otpor movement later did overthrow him. And the UN's criminal tribunal later effectively and posthumously exonerated him of his charges in a lengthy ruling on another defendant. The US had worked vigorously for the breakup of Yugoslavia and intentionally prevented negotiated agreements among the parties. Then UN Secretary General Butros Butros Ghali said, quote, in its first weeks in office, the Clinton administration has administered a death blow to the Vance Owen plan that would have given the Serbs 43% of the territory of a unified state. In 1995, at Dayton, the administration took pride in an agreement that, after nearly three more years of horror and slaughter, gave the Serbs 49% in a state partitioned into two entities." End quote. Three years later came the Kosovo War. The US believed that, unlike Crimea, Kosovo had the right to secede. But the United States did not want it done, like Crimea, without any people getting killed. In the June 14, 1999 issue of The Nation, George Kenney, a former State Department Yugoslavia desk officer, reported, quote, an unimpeachable press source who regularly travels with Secretary of State Madeleine Albright told this writer that swearing reporters to deep background confidentiality at the Rambugay talks, a senior State Department official had bragged that the United States deliberately set the bar higher than the Serbs could accept. The Serbs needed, according to the official, a little bombing to see reason, end quote. Jim Jotras, a foreign policy aide to Senate Republicans, reported in a May, 19, May 18, 1999 speech at Cato Institute in DC that he had it, quote, on good authority that a senior administration official told the media under embargo, quote, we intentionally set the bar too high for the Serbs to comply. They need some bombing and that's what they're going to get, end quote. In interviews with Fairness and Accuracy in reporting, both Kenny and Jatras asserted that these were actual quotes, quotes transcribed by reporters who spoke with US officials. The UN did not authorize the United States and its NATO allies to bomb Serbia in 1999, neither did the United States Congress. The US engaged in a massive bombing campaign that killed large numbers of people, ended, injured many more, destroyed civilian infrastructure, hospitals and media outlets, created a refugee crisis. This destruction was accomplished through lies, fabrications, exaggerations about atrocities, and then justified anachronistically as a response to violence that it helped generate. In the year prior to the bombing, some 2,000 people were killed, a majority by Kosovo Liberation Army guerrillas who, with support from the CIA, were seeking to incite a Serbian response that would appeal to Western humanitarian warriors. 
At the same time, NATO member Turkey was committing much larger atrocities with 80% of their weapons coming from the US. But Washington didn't want a war with Turkey, so no propaganda campaign was built around its crimes. Instead, weapons shipments were increased to Turkey. In contrast, a propaganda campaign on Kosovo established a model that would be followed in future wars, connecting exaggerated and fictional atrocities to the Nazi Holocaust. A photo of a thin man seen through barbed wire was reproduced endlessly, but investigative journalist Philip Knightley determined that it was likely the reporters and photographers who were behind the barbed wire, and that the place photographed while ugly was a refugee camp that people, including the fat man standing next to the thin man, were free to leave. There were indeed atrocities, but most of them occurred after the bombing, not before it, and most of Western reporting inverted that chronology. Last night, Pete also labeled the Israeli Six-Day War of 1967 the quintessentially justifiable war on the part of Israel. Israeli General Mati Pelled, popular hero of that war, has a son named Miko Pelled who wrote this six years ago, quote, in 67, as today, the two power centers in Israel were the IDF High Command and the Cabinet. On June 2, 1967, the two groups met at IDF headquarters. The military hosts greeted the generally cautious and dovish Prime Minister Levi Eshkol with such a level of belligerence that the meeting was later commonly called the General's Coup. The transcripts of that meeting, which I found in the Israeli army archives, reveal that the generals made it clear to Eshkol that the Egyptians would need 18 months to two years before they would be ready for a full-scale war. And therefore, this was the time for a preemptive strike. My father told Eshkol, quote, Nasser is advancing an ill-prepared army because he is counting on the cabinet being hesitant. Your hesitation is working in his advantage, end quote. Throughout the meeting, there was no mention of a threat, but rather of an opportunity that was there to be seized. Within short order, the cabinet succumbed to the pressure of the army, and the rest, as they say, is history." End quote. Now, a so-called preemptive mass slaughter, followed by decades of illegal genocidal occupation, justified by a danger 18 months away, I propose to you, bears zero similarity to what you should do if you see someone confronting, confronted by a mugger in a dark alley in Harrisonburg. As mugging victims and surgeons and good Samaritans never justify their behavior with analogies to war, how about we do them the same courtesy and not justify war with analogies to such unrelated endeavors? In 2011, so that NATO could begin bombing Libya, the African Union was prevented by NATO from presenting a peace plan to Libya. In 2003, Iraq was open to unlimited inspections and even the departure of its president, according to numerous sources, including the president of Spain, to whom US President Bush recounted Hussein's offer to leave. In 2001, Afghanistan was open to turning Osama bin Laden over to a third country for trial. Go back through history. The U.S. sabotaged peace proposals for Vietnam. The Soviet Union proposed peace negotiations before the Korean War. Spain wanted the sinking of the USS Maine to go to international arbitration before the Spanish-American War. Mexico was willing to negotiate the sale of its northern half. In each case, the U.S. preferred war. Peace has to be carefully avoided. So when someone asks me, what would I do instead of attacking Afghanistan? I have three answers, progressively less flippant. One, don't attack Afghanistan. Two, prosecute crimes as crimes don't commit new crimes. Use diplomacy and the rule of law. Talk. And three, work to create a world with systems of justice and dispute resolution and economies and politics that do without the institution of war altogether. P.S. All of the questions are going to be about World War II regardless, and so I am saving that for the Q&A <laughs> period. I will beg your permission to do so. Happy Mardi Gras. Thanks for being here. Right. Thank you, David. Now we'll turn it left. Pete, have three minutes. Please, the response to that. Um, your, your political background comes through and the use of, uh, selective use of facts to, I think, to distort the situation, including what I said. I never said that uh, the 
I never referred to the U.S. Yemeni war. As a member of the U.S. military, I know our army isn't doing anything there at least. But let's do quickly. He wanted to put World War II off to the end. Well, obviously, because when Germany attacked to the east against Russia, the Soviet Union, the Soviet Union was justified in fighting back. And when they attacked Poland, the Poles were justified in fighting back against that invasion. And when they attacked France, the people of France were justified in fighting to save their lives and their political community. That's why he doesn't want to talk about it. June 25th, 1950, North Korea sent 75,000 troops, armored troops, across the border into South Korea. That started the war. There were minor border incursions. The only forces up there um, you know, were to stop minor things between the North and South Koreans. I think it's crazy to think the United States wanted the war because we were so woefully unprepared for it. I mean, the Korean War is a war we, we had const, you know, troops in Japan that hadn't been training. They went over there and got slaughtered. To think that we would want a war and to be so unprepared for war is just absurd. 1990, I don't know why he's worried, why he's such a defender of Saddam Hussein. He invaded the people of Kuwait. There was widespread executions, rape. They stole everything from that country, the copper pipes, copper wires, and took them north. Uh, he's worried about one case of an ambassador's son, you know, coaching someone to, to talk. That's a, it's true, but not representative, and it misses the fundamental thing of the people of Kuwait should not have to sit around and not fight back when they're being murdered in that sense. Bosnia, I really don't know how you cannot understand that in Bosnia from 1992 to 1995, before the United States forces went in, 200 to 300,000 people died in that war, tens of thousands of women raped, people in concentration camps, the only thing that stopped that killing was military force. People negotiate when it's backed up by military force. If you don't have anything to back it up, if you're not willing to use it, they won't stop the bad people who cause these wars. We all wish we could be in a world without war, but that's not the world that we exist in. So if we could be aware of, you know, it, people complain about President Trump Right, because Trump will say some Mexican or Latin American illegal immigrants committed rape. Okay, some did, and some are in you know MI13 or MS13 or whatever. That's not representative. So things can be a true fact pulled out of context, but it shouldn't be the thing that you base your argument on. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, what Pete said about Yemen last night is on a video on my website, davidswanson.org. The notion that I mentioned the Korean War in any way, shape, or form, or defended Saddam Hussein in any way, shape, or form, you've just witnessed the absence of, and it's being recorded on video. Nonviolence works better than violence to overthrow domestic tyranny and increasingly in marginal examples to resist foreign tyranny, and we know this and we're much better skilled at it now than at the time of World War II when it was developing. It has developed incredibly. The United States was not threatened at the time of World War II. The, it, Roosevelt had to lie to the US public to try to build support for it. The United States was not surprised the White House was not surprised by a Japanese attack. It was intentionally provoked, which obviously does not excuse a murderous attack by Japan. It simply points out the fact that it was intentionally provoked in order to get the United States into both parts of that war. The United States and nations around the world had refused to accept the Jews, leading Hitler to accuse them of hypocrisy and to escalate the violence against the Jews. Uh, and, and so the mythology that's been built up where the glory and the goodness of the necessity of that war is played off against the evil of the other side in that war has to look 
at the evil that led to it, has to look at the disastrous conclusion of World War I that led to predictions of World War II on the spot. It was not necessary. The West's support for the Nazis during the 30s, this was not a war that ever had to happen, and that when the US got into it, got into it in the worst possible way, escalated it in the worst possible way, normalized the killing of civilians as opposed to soldiers, the worst thing that's ever happened on planet Earth. Nothing to be proud of. Thank you. That was round one. Now we have round two, and we'll hear from Pete. I just want to remind everyone that the topic of the debate, the question is, is war ever justifiable? We're not debating US foreign policy. We're not debating the role of the CIA. We're not debating whether someone said something later to any, you know, it, at some think tank. The question is, is war ever justifiable? And if your answer is no, then the only moral response to that that would be consistent is that we should have no military. Because if there is no moral use of the military under any conditions, we should not have a military. We should not pay a penny for it. We should not have a soldier. And is that, do people really think that's true? We would all love that to be true. We could save a lot of money if we didn't have police force. We should start here and now and say, we will disband all police departments because they use violence. Because some of them use violence wrongly. And so let's reject the whole institution. Now we know that's not the case because we know if we didn't have police, bad people would do bad things and our life of security would go away. It's the same here as in Harrisonburg as it is in the world. Now as I hope is clear, I am not pro-war. I mean, this is not a debate of pro-war versus anti-war. This is a debate of, is war ever justifiable? Or is it never justifiable? Do people set up governments to secure peace and security and the blessings of liberty? Or is that not the role of government? Is the government just supposed to do other things but not secure its own people? I think if we look at our founders, one of their first concerns it was you know, for the common defense, right, to secure the blessings of liberty. So conceptually, I want everyone to think three things, because a lot of times my uh, debate partner here will fall into arguing against militarism, and no one's arguing for militarism. Militarism, which I would say is dominant among our political elite now, are those who think that war is a solution to a lot of problems, that war it doesn't need to be a last resort, that war should be done in terms of our national interest. That's immoral. We all agree on that. Pacifists say war is never the answer. So we just got, so logically we need to get rid of our military, right? And then we'll see what happens. All I'm arguing for is that there are conditions and situations in which defending your political community or helping another community defend themselves against unjust aggression is a morally right option. So we understand the terms of our debate here. So he was referring to, um, you know, last night I talked about, if, any, if you look me up, you know, I have offered a rights-based justification for killing and for war. And I talked about that last night. I'll try to give a two-minute summary. But then I want to talk specifically to this audience because I'm a Christian. And my biggest challenge as a soldier, one I had to wrestle with, was how can I be a Christian and follow the two great commandments and be a soldier? And so I want to have time to share that with this overwhelmingly Christian audience. So first, what is a secular rights-based justification for ever killing? And it also follows to war. The moral problem of war is killing. Right? We can all agree on that. And so if you can't justify killing, you can't justify war. And if you justify killing and apply it to the context of war, then you justify war. So here's a two-minute version. Every human being is endowed by our creator with certain unalienable rights. The rights to life and liberty are the two greatest among those. If you don't have the right to life and the right to liberty, 
the other rights don't matter. Now really what that is is the right not to be killed, the right not to be enslaved by another person. It's a negative right, a claim of, about other people. And that's why, and every human being has this right. We don't have to earn it, but we can forfeit it. Because if we go and violate another person's rights, if we go and try to kill someone else, we forfeit our right. That is why natural law makes it inherent that you have the right to self-defense. And because it's the person who chooses to threaten another human being who still possesses their right, who forfeits his for that time, that's why third party people can also come in, like the police officer, right? So if someone is attacking you, it's not just you fighting back, other people can come and help you. Because what's morally relevant is that when a human being does violence to another human being or is imminently threatening to do that, that, that attacker forfeits his right. Now, human beings don't live as atomistic individuals. We always come together to live in community. The things that make us human are things that happen in community. Creativity, art, family, love only happens in community. So our communities matter to us. And so when we come together in community, these groupings of human beings who possess the rights to life and liberty, our community takes on the rights of territorial integrity or community integrity and sovereignty, the ability to make our decisions as our own community. And so when someone attacks that community, it attacks everyone within that community. And that community has the right to fight back. And human beings recognize that because if you're with a group that you love, you defend them. Sergeant First Class Petri, I don't know why I'm getting emotional, but he lost his hand in Iraq. They were sitting in the courtyard, he's a ranger, platoon sergeant, grenade comes flying in, lands right among them. He, other people like are jumping out of the way, he grabs the grenade, as he's throwing it out of the courtyard, it goes off, long off his hand. He was asked, why when a grenade comes into the room do you go towards it rather than away from it? And he said, if you're at Thanksgiving dinner and some grenade or some bomb comes through your window, are you going to run? No. You're going to get it and you're going to protect your family. You're going to protect those you love. So part of being in a community is caring about the other people and being to live for something larger than yourself. And when we hear those stories, we are uplifted. That's you know, what uplift.com you see on Facebook. You watch these stories and you cry all the time. In every case, it is people going outside of themselves, sacrificing themselves for others. And it's the most deeply human and moral thing we see. So communities have the right to defend themselves. We have the right to defend each other when we're threatened. But here's the challenge, right, a chaplain. I had one friend, I had some good Christian friends, one came up and said, hey, Pete, I hope you're right when you're talking about the justification of war, because if you're wrong, you're leading people into sin. It would put your soul at risk. I was like, I know, I'm trying to study this more. And then I had a minister come up to me and he say, hey, he saw one of my talks, it was an army conference on the moral justification of war. And he said, everything focuses for you around this right not to be killed. He said, but Jesus didn't command us respect other people's rights. He said, love one another as I've loved you. Love one another as you love yourself. So how is war consistent with love? And so I want to talk through that. And again, we'll start with our own experience of family, community, and how that can apply to war. Because I think it sounds really strange to put love and war together. I actually had an article for Army Magazine. The only one they ever rejected, it was titled, Leaders should love their soldiers. And the civilian editors just didn't get it. Everyone in the military got it. Right? It had 8,000 reads the first day it was up um, by, by military people. So let's talk love. Right? So love is, is willing the good for another. And my first premise, we should understand that love entails protection for others. What mother or what father will not protect their child from threats, whether it's a car coming in down the street, or whether it's an animal, or whether it's a child molester, right, or a killer. And the only time I saw my mom, who's a very peaceful lady and a saint, um, get violent was a dog coming after us. Um, and she just went, I like kicked it. I was like, holy cow, mom. 
You know, it's just about that tall. But love is protection. And we will do anything to protect. So here's one of your scenarios you don't like, right? You're off on a vacation up in the mountains, enjoying, you know, the nature with your family, and it's just you. There is a gun in the house, right? Because you're in Virginia and you hunt. And um, and it's crazy, like one of those people who took away Elizabeth Smart comes in and he's like, hey, I like this little girl. I'm gonna have my way with her, right? What are you gonna do? Now, first you're gonna say, don't do this, right? This is not a good thing. That would be a horrible thing, right? He just punches you and throws you off to the side. No, sorry, I'm gonna have my way, I'm gonna kill her, right? What are your options there? Or what does love demand? I tell you, love doesn't demand saying, well, you can be violent, but I'm not gonna be violent, and let me talk to you about it, and maybe later you'll change your mind. No, the child will not feel loved if you do that. You should go get the gun and threaten it and say, hey, I'm serious, stop now, right? And if the person won't, you should use whatever force is necessary to protect the innocent person. That's what love demands. Now, not all love is that personal. What if a police officer came up? Police, fire, you know, firefighters, military, these are people with a strong sense of generalized love for their community and pride in their community. And they're willing to risk their lives for others. If a police officer comes up, the great things about police is since that is the way they serve community, they can do it, am I good on time? They can do it professionally. They train on how to do it all the time. That's why we want the police to come up. That's why we call them. The police have clubs. The police are really good at negotiating with people. The police have tasers. The police have a bunch of them. And if oh, absolutely necessary, the police would use lethal force to stop a horrible threat like a murder or a rape. So when the police are coming in, and if, even if they have to grab that person and beat them, it's actually an act of love. It's not inconsistent with love for that person. We'll talk about that in a second. It's a deep act of love for the victim. One of the things that is upsetting to me about pacifists, and I encourage you to look at all the pacifist arguments, and even if you consider your pacifist yourself, they really focus on the other combatant. And they say, gosh, that poor kid doesn't know what's going on, is misinformed, um, is getting paid, doesn't really know what's going on. And you know what? That's true in war. I was at a, um, at a shore, a youth shore, which is everyone from like 15 to 35 at a district outpost in, in Afghanistan, like the Pakistan border. And they just do a shore so the sub-governor brings all these people in. There's like 200 young people. Some of them walk for hours. And the governor says, District Governor, um, why are the Americans here? And they were all like, I know, I know, I know, I know. To make us convert to Christianity or they'll kill us. <laughs> He's like, no, this is why you're all joining the Taliban. And they showed a movie, an Afghan produced movie that explained 9-11 and explained things from a different perspective. So one of the very sad things about war is that a lot of the times the enemy combatants have reduced moral responsibility. It is true that they don't fully understand what they're going, that they're misinformed, that they're child soldiers, that they're just trying to have some credibility in their society, whatever else, right? So there's a sadness in that. But we, the focus on war should be on the people you're protecting. Any just war is protecting an innocent political community that is threatened and the love is primarily focused towards them. When we focus on who we're protecting, two things will happen. One, we'll only get into just wars, right? It'll be much more likely that, that we'll be doing that. And two, it, it'll help make sense of the violence that has to happen in war. You're using violence to stop violence and to prevent greater violence. And soldiers have, so now I'll jump up to the soldier level. Um, soldiers talk about love a whole lot. It is love of country. I know, and I heard it at dinner the other night, well, people only join the military because they can't get a real job. People join the military because they're all messed up anyway, right? If you think that, you're wrong. And I almost guarantee you haven't served in the military at least in the last 30 years. I'm not the smartest guy in the world, like about a 132 GT, you know, uh, whatever you call it, IQ. I have never had the highest GT score in my unit my enlisted soldiers. So if you think people join the military because they can't get a real job, I encourage you to go out and to meet people who are in the military. We have one right here, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Tolman. We'll be talking with his people tomorrow morning. Um, people join out of love of country, 
They tend to fight in the moment out of love for their brothers and sisters. They care deeply about the justice of their war. How much time do I have? Okay, six minutes, that's good. Um, actually, I think, he did, I think I'll end, I was, you know, we're so worried. I, my brain is, is uh, programmed for 55 minutes. That's what our time is at West Point every class. And uh, so anything shorter than that, I think I've sped up. I hope it made sense, but now we'll open it up to rebuttals and then we'll be getting to the Q&A, which I think we're both really looking forward to. Okay, thank, thank you. you very much, Pete. And David now. So I tried to give a pretty thorough rejection of each war that I heard last night was a just war. And I've heard zero rebuttal to that, zero defense of those wars, and zero new nominations for just wars. Uh, can I just speak and then you get a turn? Uh, World War II, the obvious one from a radically different, you know, from a pre-nuclear, pre-skilled nonviolence, pre-end of colonialism, I mean, an irrelevant war from that far back that we will talk about at great length, but it will take me a week, not 20 minutes, to persuade anybody on. We'll get to that one. But other than that one, you know, the, uh, the top program, the top expense of the, top of the past 72 years, uh, where are the examples of the just wars? Uh, it, does someone bravely and lovingly sacrificing his hand in a war that was not needed and that took away members of millions of families somehow justify that war? Did Jesus say, thou must love thy subordinates? Or did he say, love your enemies? That's the hard one. That's the challenge to love your enemies, to stop categorizing people as evil, bad people because they are defending a country that your country is attacking. That's the hard one. War is not policing. Police are supposed to de-escalate violence. They're supposed to target specific people for a good reason and take them to court. War is, by definition, the escalation of violence and le the legitimation of murder, not in actual self-defense, not in national self-defense, and only murder, not torture. This confuses a lot of people with murder. Why not torture? Not theft, not cheating on your taxes, only murder. It's the only thing you're allowed to do wrong in these wars, and it is not justifiable. The, the, the Gulf War, if it still has its, its standing as the just war of the past three quarters of a century, does the Gulf War, which I think I gave a pretty thorough refutation of the justness of, does it outweigh all the other U.S. wars of the past 72 years, the millions killed, the refugees, the chaos, the environmental damage, the even greater deaths and damages from the diversion of funds from useful purposes? I don't think it can possibly do that, and I don't think any war in the future can possibly do anything like that. Okay, thank you, David. I do think that we should love our enemies, not just love the people we're protecting, but love our enemies. That will be somewhat of a paradigm shift. I interviewed hundreds of people. I went through more than 50 units in war. Leaders can create climates of great respect and even compassion for their misguided enemy. I've seen it done. I've seen units that have their soldiers watch Red Dawn just to appreciate what the other side's perspective could be and absolutely demanded respect when we wound soldier, enemy soldiers, we you know, evacuate them under the same criteria as we, as we do our own soldiers. So we do love our soldiers. And I did, I just forgot to, to uh, say some of the other wars. Just war, Iraq being invaded by ISIS, 2014. If you're a Yazidi, if you're a Christian living in Mosul, they came through and executed all men, took the women away for rape. The role of the government isn't to go, come on, let's talk about that, guys. The role of the government is to prevent that destruction of their people. That's what government should do as a primary thing. Yeah, Kuwait against Iraq. You're caught up on us helping out other people, whatever. The Kuwaitis had a right to fight back. That's why I said the French had a right to fight back. The Polans had a right to fight back. And I think it's pretty good for us to go risk our lives to help them fight to reclaim their rights. South Korean soldiers when the North Korean invaded. Um, so 
the wars are going on all the time. One thing I do agree with David on is that war is a crime. War is always a crime. But the victim is not a criminal. In a murder, an attempted murder, in a rape, yes, there's a crime. There's a, the aggressor, the person doing it. But the person fighting back, the people trying to stop that crime, they are not criminals. They are doing the morally and legally right thing, and they should be commended for it. So we shouldn't conflate all parties in, a, in war in the same way we don't conflate all parties in every other crime going on. All right, so now it's your turn to ask questions and to provoke conversation with our panelists. What are the questions that you are wanting to ask or the contribution to the conversation is war justified? If you could stand and speak loudly because I don't think this will reach to you. Um, stand, say your name, and ask your question. So there is a, well, why move this mic down, so, so, and if you can, if, oh, here we have a, well, this one, yeah. I am Bill Sanders. Um, I uh, am a little older than either of the speakers here tonight, and uh, I want to come down on the side of might makes right. I mean, once we start using power, I don't care who it was that started. Might makes right in the long run. Uh, whoever happens to have, look, we fought our civil war, and it come down that might won that war. Uh, now, West Point, had gave, West Point had trained the officers on both sides in that war. And so uh, I would like for the panel to think about how do we justify military officers leading their men into whatever they do, be they General Grant or General Lee? Um, there are decisions to be made, and uh, T.C. Mitts, the man in the street, can't make these decisions. Um, in World War II, I served in the Americal Infantry Division. Um, later on, the Americal became uh, infamous because they were the host of the Malai incident. Now there was a commander that led his troops and let them do terrible atrocities uh, simply because, well, were they defending our nation? That's a question that I want answered. Thank you, Bill. You know, if we had a mass conversion tomorrow and we, re as a society, we wanted to change something, we wanted to end mass incarceration or fossil fuel use or something, would the first step be to go pick out some big fields and have our young people kill each other up to, say, three quarters of a million of them and then pass a law to do the thing? Or would we just jump straight to passing the law to do the thing, right? So you can, you can look back at the Civil War and say, well, the rest of the world more or less ended slavery and serfdom without civil wars, but for this reason and that reason, it was great to have a civil war. Okay, but isn't there a better way of looking at changing the world today than that incredibly backward? You know, and and to, to say, that, well, we're innocent passers-by and we see victims of a terrorist organization that we were the, had the principal rule, role in creating, namely ISIS, uh, and so we must now intervene in this mess we've created. You, you know, you, you can't, you're not an innocent passerby. You're not a good Samaritan, a bad Samaritan, you're no kind of Samaritan. You're responsible in, in, in large part for having created the disaster in the first place, uh, which is one reason these analogies are extremely silly. Uh, you know, we, we are in a different world now where the studies show us that nonviolent movements are over twice as likely to succeed and those successes are far longer lasting. It's the strategic, stronger tool to use. Three 
three quick points, sir. Um, one, you know, the expression might makes right uh, could be either a description or a normative statement, right? Uh, sometimes it's upsetting that might does, like you win the war and you, then there's no war crimes against you in most cases and you can help write the history books. You see what Japan, their perspective, that can go on in a lot of places. Um, what we're talking about is what should be right, ethics. So I think we should say, yes, that might doesn't make right. Right stands on its own independently, and we should use our might only in support of what's right. So first point. Second, um, I said it was right for the Iraqis, the Christians, the Azizis, and the government that supports them to defend themselves against ISIS. Don't bring the United States into it. This is not a US foreign policy thing. Don't be so American-centric. People all over the world have human rights and they have the right to defend their own communities, whether or not we help them. Our goal should be making sure we're never the aggressor. And finally, dime. We talk about military power. There is, we use, I think there's a longer term than dime now. We should always go with diplomatic power, informational power, economic power, and only use military power as a last resort. But we should use all of our elements of national power to defend human rights around the world. The US Army profession document Doctrine says the only justification for the use of military force is the defense of human rights. Another question. S since I have the microphone, my name is Dwight Vaughn. I um, want to pursue the notion that if the only tool you have is a hammer, then everything starts to look like a nail. And how much of what happens in the world today is driven by corporate greed? If I'm a munitions manufacturer, then guess what I want? Uh, and I, I've always thought that we should devote as much of our economy to peace as we do to uh, war. Uh, I, I certainly do. Uh, I, I think Pete agrees to a great extent as well. I don't know what extent you can put a number on it. I, again, would gradually take us down to none of this evil institution. Uh, you know, the Congress members will tell you, senators will tell you that they are paid to do what they are doing year after year, moving the money. They, they, they talk, Pentagon officials, often anonymously, but Pentagon officials will tell the media now that, that building up hostility toward Russia is about the weapons business. You know, they're open about this. Uh, it, it used to be shameful in this country to be a war profiteer. Uh, it, it's now acceptable. You, you know, you can be a, a stand-up, uh, leading, you know, robber baron uh, of of this new day and age, uh, profiting from death. You know, the, the the Pope said to the joint session of Congress, "You have blood on your hands. End this arms trade." Uh, and they stood up and cheered for it and escalated the arms trade. Uh, you know, it, it is a. It is not the sole motivation of the wars. Nothing is. The, the wars have numerous motivations, all of them disgraceful and shameful and not all of them even rational. But it is a, it is a leading cause. So I'll make two comments. One which will sound like, well, I am a critic of the military industrial complex. You know, we have colonels, 06s, senior officers, more ranked than I ever had, um, who are assigned to countries who have the job of helping increase arms sales and do arms deals. I think that's terrible. We shouldn't be doing that. Um, but I do want to challenge my opponent to be consistent. If he believes, as he's believed for a long time, that war is never justifiable, then let's not hear any of this gradual stuff. You need to get up there and say, stop the military now. Stop all funding. Come home. Let go of every soldier. We'll pay you a salary for a year until you can get another job. That's the consistent position. And if you're afraid of saying that out loud, then I'm not sure you believe in the other stuff you're preaching. Yes, please. Uh, I, that is what I want. That's not what I think I can get. Uh, and I think I'm going to get to zero military by getting to a first step towards zero military. And when I say let's agree to get rid of the, the weapons that have no possible defensive purpose or let's agree to get rid of the foreign bases, these are steps in the direction. Would I like to do all of the steps immediately in every country on earth? Yes, of course. 
Uh, but to, to say, now you're the one who wants to be U.S. centric. You're the one who wants to say, let's leave the rest of the world out of the picture and just talk about the U.S. No, th the whole world has to abandon this institution. But as the one country that is over half you know, of the world's war making, that is the leading war maker, that is pushing the other countries to do more investments in war making and beating them all at it, the U.S. is the big one that has to do it. And if it does, it's going to lead other countries in that direction. It, that doesn't mean that until we've eliminated all of the weapons, there should be any wars. It means that there should not, the, every war should end now, including every U.S. war should end now. And this fantasy that there's such a thing as a last resort that somehow you run out of ideas. Because every, every real world example you give me of a war that was a last resort turns out not to have been remotely close to having been a last resort. Well, when North Korea said 75,000 troops, they were beyond last resort, they were already getting killed. But if it makes you feel better, I do not teach the principle of last resort when I teach just war theory. What we just say is all reasonable, nonviolent, attempts have been tried and failed. Because you're right, you don't know it's the last resort until they've killed you. Then you're like, oh darn, that la N minus one was my last resort and I missed the opportunity. So you're right on a logical point uh, on that. Um, oh, here's, I thought you said, and we and other nations will all get rid of our militaries. No, 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 no. We just need to get rid of our whole army. Because it's a good world, and we trust other people. If you don't trust other people, like that's why you support the police. If you don't trust everyone in the world, that's why you need to have an armed forces. And so if you really believe it, that there's never a just war, we should never enter into a war. All right, we're going to turn to the audience again and have some more conversation. Thank you. Yeah, we've been talking about 21st century and 20th century. How about a little 19th century? I'd like to hear each of you say a little bit about North versus South and the Civil War. South claiming it had the right to secede, et cetera, et cetera, and it was being invaded. North saying, no, they're the ones that fired on Fort Sumter. Uh, North presumably defending against, uh, in terms of the whole slavery thing, the, the uh, uh, compromises for the Western countries and this kind of stuff. Anyway. Just, just say a little bit about the just war or non-just war of North or South and South. That's a great question. I could have to do a paper on it. <laughs> the, um, because America, the, the moral justification of our government is government by, of the people, by the people, for the people. It is the, uh, John Locke's idea of self-determination. And so if the South wanted to secede, they have the right to secede to establish their own government as I see it, a moral right. So the North should have let them go. At the same time, the South was not a legitimate political community. When you deny the humanity of one third of your population, you are not a legitimate government wherever you are at whatever time. So I think it would have been appropriate for those who were enslaved to rise up in revolution to try to get a government that didn't systematically deny their humanity. And I think it would have been appropriate for the North to support that uprising. So, um, Maybe there could have been nonviolent ways for that to come out. I don't think that the thing that started it, just the separation of the union, was morally justified. I think it's worth recalling that it was the South that insisted on federal power and the northern states that wanted the state's rights to not send people back into slavery. Uh, I, I think it's worth recalling that there were peace negotiations in Washington, D.C. right up to the last minute, uh, and there were models that had worked in other countries and in Washington, D.C. Compensated emancipation worked in Washington, D.C. Uh, it was not impossible, it was not beyond human understanding uh, to settle this dispute. And in fact, had the dispute been limited to existing territory, there was ample room for agreement and compromise and settlement. It was the universal, unquestioned agreement by both sides that the United States must expand westward 
that created the, the topics where no agreement became po was possible. The, it, it was the universal agreement without any sort of discussion or consideration that imperialism was the mandate that created the, this impossibility of agreeing on whether the new territory stolen through genocidal settler colonialism would be free or slave. Uh, I agree with Pete that there ought to be a right to secession. Uh, I also think there ought to be a right not to be enslaved. Uh, but I think there are certainly now and even then better ways to do it than killing three quarters of a million people first, which didn't end slavery, still hasn't ended slavery in the case of punishment for a crime, has created lasting resentment and bitterness and hideous statues over in my hometown of Charlottesville that need to come down and are not still up because of racism. They're still up because the state of Virginia forbids taking down any war monument. This is the, it's the universal acceptance unquestioned now that thou shalt not take down any war monument. And there is not any rule, any law that says thou shalt not take down any peace monument. And usually I say it would be hard to find one. There's actually one across the, the lawn out here, a beautiful one of guns turned into a plowshare. Uh, there's no law against taking that one down. That's a, that's a problem in our society. All right, we have another question out here, a couple more questions. So we'll take these two together and then we'll come to the state. Hi, yes, um, my name is Katrina Poplett. I'm an EMU student here, I'm a graduate student getting my master's in restorative justice. Um, one thing that I was struck by is that we focused a lot on the international wars um, that the United States has instigated. Um, what I'm really curious about is the, um, the justification for waging intentional war on our own people of color, um, particularly as evidence has come to light and was in the light as well during the 80s um, as cocaine was funneled into communities of color in addition to um, the CIA and FBI planting evidence. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm very curious on that perspective of how um, you view policing a lot differently than I do. Um, and so I'm really curious as to how your justification of policing works um, and of waging war on our own people when they're systematically being oppressed by our own government and milita military forces as we've seen consistently in the last few years. Thank you, and we'll take one more question from the audience before. I'm David Schwartz from Louisa, Virginia. Suppose you identify a particular war that is justifiable. How do you keep it pure? Once you let the genie out of the bottle, how do you control that monster? Usually a defensive war becomes an aggressive war and pillaging and raping and everything follows with it. And how do you, I, I don't see that there's any governing body that determines what's really morally justifiable and what isn't. And when it is out of control, how to bring it back into control. To your first question, I mean, war is never going to be pure, but Nothing. I mean, if you look at marriage as a wonderful institution, a lot of people are involved in marriage, you're still going to always have marriages where abuse, where neglect, where other things go on. So anything with tons of people is never going to be pure. That was probably too strong a word. There is, it is very possible to fight a war with great moral restraint where you're only intentionally targeting combatants, um, where rape does not occur. That requires strong leadership. I can tell you, I was extraordinarily impressed. Um, as an ethicist, you know, going to war, and I was a, a major, I was a field grade officer before you know, 2001, um, so I'd had a lot of experience, but not in war. And I did in-depth, you know, three-hour interviews. People were extraordinarily honest. And I think war is conducted much more morally than many people think. It's not like wars. And so, um, but that said, there are always going to be crimes in war. When you have that much fear, that much emotion, that much violence, bad things are going to happen. And so part of the calculation for a war should be that some bad things are going to happen. The fog of war and, and the soldiers who can't handle the stress of the responsibility. But overwhelmingly, I mean, war can be handled and kept within things. It doesn't necessarily 
like Clausewitz would say, it always just has no natural land, gets worse and worse. Um, that's not the experience of the American military. And I know we have another one, but we'll both answer this one. Well, it's the experience of people observing the U.S. military for certain. Um, I, you know, the, you, can, you can certainly say that, that there's good and bad in the institution of marriage. I, I agree, 100%. People said that about the institution of slavery as well. People said that about trial by ordeal, about dueling, about numerous institutions that were accepted as normal and natural and, and unendable and were ended, including the institution of lynching, which is another sort of war on people of color. Um, I, I think the point about war being unpredictable and uncontrollable once it starts uh, was very well said. I couldn't say it any better. I think it's even more important in a nuclear age to recognize that, uh, and, and I think it's important that there is no empirical test uh, that would allow us to identify what is an acceptable war or what any of the, these just war criteria that people throw at us, oh, well, that's a proportional uh, maneuver, that's a proportional bombing, you killed just the right number of people and no more. There's no empirical way to go out and observe that and say, no, that was too few people or that was too many people. It's just rhetoric, and it's rhetoric used to move people in directions they wouldn't go if, if they were looking at, at concrete facts. Okay, the, there was another question from Katrina. Well, on policing. And well, uh, it, it seemed to be a question for, for Pete about isn't policing a terrible analogy, and, and yeah, it is. <laughs> no, it's not, because you can be critical. We can be critical of police officers, who we all call whenever we're threatened, right, or have a problem. Um, and we recognize good policing and bad policing. If police are too violent, if police are not fair, if they're racist, we recognize it and we recognize it in wrong as wrong and we call it out as wrong. I don't think the institution and the idea of policing is flawed. <laughs> I think there are criminals in the world, there are sociopaths in the world, and we need police. And every society throughout history is needed to have some force there for the protection of others. I do want to point out, like I really I think it's inappropriate to talk about a war on the people of color. War is violent. War is intentionally killing people. War is going for some political objective by the aggressor and the defense of a community by um, those uh, you know, protecting themselves. And I think, we, I wish for different reasons, we don't like the term war on this, war on that. I think we need to recognize that war is a big jump from anything else we do. There's no other thing we do where we're going out intentionally killing large amounts of people because a whole large amounts of people are threatened. Other things, war on drugs, war on people of color, war on fat, uh, I think undermines the moral clarity and the moral weight we should give to the decision to go to war. Okay, are there, a, oh, do you, you really want to respond? No. Okay. Other okay, other questions out here? Yeah. And Martha Fong, um, a test of a moral imperative is what would life be like, what would our world be like if everybody did it. When I think of pacifism, if the whole country did it, the only um, fear that anybody might have would be would somebody from outside our country come in and take advantage of that. But, but when I think of just war theory, I think of what we have become in terms of thinking that war solves things for us. And I don't think we could have a better example than this week, this past seven days. Our legislator, legislature actually voted in more money for defense in the budget than Trump asked for. Trump also pushed for renewing the nuclear devices. We already have enough nuclear power to annihilate the world. And we want to go back and make sure we've got it, because maybe we've left out some country. I'd like to hear, I think, the just war proponent especially, respond to how, how you stay with the concept of a just war and prevent this overwhelming 
sense that we have, that we, that we somehow grow into, that it's going to solve everything for us. I think the key is that we educate people on what makes a war morally justified. That is a, a high burden to pass. Um, I think, you know, I'm working on a book and one potential title is you know, The Conspiracy of Ignorance. Sometimes I wonder whether our political elites, you know, we all learn trigonometry, most of us never have to use it. But the biggest moral decision a country makes, the most expensive moral decision a country makes, is a decision to go to war. And I can't even find anyone on CNN, MSNBC, who can talk, who even uses the framework of the morality of war. They are all like militaries. They're all talking about economic power, national interest, who's going to help in the next election. So I almost worry that the ignorance is given such power to a, a, an unrecognized militarism that is discrediting just war. Uh, because I thought you were going to say, you know, if, everyone, if we all decided to be pacifists, it would be great if the whole world were pacifists. It would be great if everyone in the world were honest and respectful of property and super kind and took care of the poor. It, it would be a great world. But that's not the world we live in. There's a problem of evil. There's the fallen nature of man. And so I think what we have to have is a healthy appreciation of just war that rejects militarism. A war like the 2003 to present war on an impoverished country thousands of miles away in Iraq, if that's not an unjust war, what is? And this is a war you took some part in rather than opposing, rather than trying to end, that you characterized in the Washington Post as doing all kinds of good for Iraq, that I ask you now on a nightly basis what that could have been. Uh, if you teach students to be moral thinkers, you know, I know people uh, in the US military who refused to go to that war. Were they right or wrong? I mean, you're talking to Lieutenant Dan Choi or something, he was totally wrong in the way he handled it. I think if you're a junior soldier who, who maybe joined, was never trained and educated, didn't have years to prepare for it, um, I'm very supportive of them become conscious objectors once they grow to understand what war is. I have very little sympathy for someone who went through four to five years of training and education and thinking about it, got a quarter of a million dollar education, and then says, oh, no, war is wrong. So... Um, I'm supportive of conscientious objection. I think absolutely our country should allow for selective conscientious objection. Not all wars aren't right. Soldiers shouldn't have to fight in all wars. Every other Western country, Western democracy, allows for selective conscientious objection. If it's a just war, then the people will go fight, or as long as it's, you know, we should have some epistemic humility about judging you know, moral decisions are made in the moment, in the time. We can all be real smart looking back. Oh yeah, we shouldn't have had 9-11. Oh yeah, we shouldn't have done that, right? But in the moment, with the information you have at hand, that's the way we have to make moral decisions and wars are pretty darn complex. Um, and so, there was one other point I was gonna make on that. Oh, what good things we did in war, oh my gosh. I mean, we rebuilt power plants, Saddam Hussein, because of the sanctions, which are nonviolent means, right, um, had limited oil for medicine. It was supposed to be food for oil. He took that money, built palaces. The infrastructure was falling apart. So we've been rebuilding infrastructure, rebuilding roads, rebuilding schools, uh, trying to rebuild a civil society in a country in which, quick story, and then I'll turn it over, 2003 Mosul. There's, the government has fallen. Bathists are hanging from trees. They've been hung or they've run away. Uh, the people hated them. Uh, it's kind of a Kurdish dominated area up there. And there's trash all over the streets. And the Iraqi guys who seem to just be sitting around smoking cigarettes all day come up to an outpost of soldiers, 101st. And they're like, they communicate. They want the soldiers to go clean up the trash, which doesn't go over well with, you know, Sergeant Airborne there. Like, go clean up your own trash. And they looked terrified. And so they brought in kind of the cultural experts, had the meeting that night. General Petraeus got involved. And what we learned is that Saddam Hussein destroyed all civil society. There was no Lions Club. 
There's no PTA. In America, if we killed all of our government officials or if they all left, we could still function. It would probably be the PTA. It would probably be Little League. We have so many civil, the Lions Club, the Rotary, and all this. The only civil society thing he couldn't destroy, because he said you had to be Bathist. Only Bathist had the freedom of assembly because he was so afraid of uprisings against him, right? The only thing he couldn't stop were the Shiite... Um, uh, mosques and those organizations and that's why they ended up with so much power after the fall so um, I forgot what the point was oh so no so it was the reestablishing systems where people were able to come and meet and felt safe to meet and to start to reestablish democracy in addition to the infrastructure we were accomplishing good He's probably not going to remember. In 2003, I was never shot at. I was handed a lot of Pepsis. I was kissed. I was hugged. I had to dance with some Iraqi woman. Um, the Shiites were very happy to see us because they had been under such horrible conditions of genocide, of draining out their swamps in the south, and of just denying them educational opportunities and freedoms uh, in their own land. All right. We have one more question from the audience. I believe the last time that we uh, had a declared war was in 1941. Uh, I think we have existed in a condition of, of well, let's fight, but let's, it's not war yet. Uh, were our founding fathers right in asking that uh, Congress approve with a declaration of war, whether it's a just war or an unjust war? Right, let's just hear the other questions. Was it okay? Yes, is the quick answer. The Founding Fathers are right, and we would do great to actually follow our Constitution. I guess uh, my, I'm Adele, and my question is this. Uh, as David said, there's an ideal, and then there are steps towards the ideal. And I guess I have the same ideal, that war is unjustifiable, because I feel that it's like, if you start with your premise, and I'd like to hear what you have to say, that war is justifiable, it just seems like there's always a way to invent a justification. Let, let's have one more from the audience, and then I'll come back up. Well, I'll, I'll do two at a time. There's what paper is for. Um, the, 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 the oligarchic, imperialist, racist, sexist founding fathers who got so many things wrong got this right, that you do not give the power of war to a single individual, it will get you wars. Now it's outdated because war is outdated, we need to eliminate it or we're not gonna survive, it's illegal whether Congress approves of it or not. You know, if China bombs your house, are you gonna ask whether the Chinese legislature went through their constitutional procedure or not? Who cares? It's still immoral, it's still murderous, it's still illegal. Uh, but, you know, the, the other thing they got right was it, when you have con Congress members holding hearings discussing how they're just impotent and powerless to prevent a nuclear war should Trump decide on the spur of the moment that he wants to start one, they are overlooking the other crucial bit that those guys got right. It starts with the letter I, it rhymes with schmimpeachment. Uh, you, you have the power to remove the guy. Uh, you know, and, and they have a constitutional duty. They have sworn an oath to uphold removing people like that from office, um, so. Uh, Abdel Rabi, uh, just want to comment on the, particularly on some of the um, comments on the Iraqi war. Uh, just to remind you that the story we have in the Middle East is basically when Saddam Hussein start going to Kuwait, he take the green light from the American ambassador to do this. Uh, secondly, regarding the, uh, why we, I'm against the war, is basically now, it's not very clear what are the reasons for the war. Uh, and if you look at the Iraqi uh, war, Mr. Greensberg, before he left to the Bush administration, he said he didn't go for the Iraqi people for their 
education or for the Shia for this. I put it bluntly for the oil. And uh, if we look at the even the Iraqi-Iran war uh, before, if you look at the reason we in the Middle East we have was basically because we are the Sunnah majority and the Shia are different. And that's what we have the Iraq take the war against the Shia. But in reality, I was at this time studying still younger students, 50 years old maybe, uh, uh, was basically because the youth was very attracted to the system in Iran, not because of the, the dogma or the creed, but because of the example of the rulers. You look at Ayatollah Khomeini, where he lived, how he behaved in his life, how the leaders behaved, and this was the point which attracted the, the youth in the Middle East, I'm talking about Egypt, to actually think about Iran. Well, so really the real threat or the Iran, uh, Iraq war, how it started by Iraq and supported by the Saudis and the other, is not, is not really related to the religion. It's related, related to that they are wanted to protect their own style of living, of dictatorship, and depleting the wealth of the people there. If we talk at the Yemen now, really started again. It says Shia and Houthi is basically Shia sect, and the Saudi is trying to dominate the Sunni, and it's a threat. But when you see now the development in the war, and that Emirate, is starting now to, to separate Yemen in north and the south. And the idea of this, they wanted to have control in all of the harbors or the port onto the south of the Gulf uh, and the entrance of the Red Sea. Uh, a second point about the gentleman here talked about the escalation of war. And really, this is, I mean, psychology and people can talk about this. When you look at a fight, sometimes it starts very small, and then it becomes out of hand. And I give you an example of the war, uh, the Dusseldorf destruction after the Second World War. It was unnecessary blanket bombing of Dusseldorf after the surrender of Fairfax. And who suffered the German people? If you look at the Hiroshima bomb, nuclear bomb, why we have to strike Nagasaki again? Why you have to? Why don't you wait until you study the reaction of this? And uh, uh, even when uh, um, I stop here, it seems that I have. Thank you for your valuable voices here in the audience. A response. Well, too many points to try to respond to, but a, a few of them. Um, if you look at nations where there are human rights abuses around the world, there is absolutely no correlation between the severity of the human rights abuses and where the humanitarian wars are launched, none. If there were, the United States would be attacking Saudi Arabia, not working with Saudi Arabia to starve and destroy the people of Yemen. Uh, on the contrary, if you look at oil producing nations, Oil consuming nations are over 100 times more likely to intervene in oil producing nations and the more oil owned and produced, the more likely, right? So, I mean, this is uh, empirical studies. The, the, the US military, I will say to its credit, has gone green, has gone environmental. The US ambassador to the United Nations is recycling 100% of the Iraq war propaganda. She's putting the word Iran in the place of Iraq. Other than that, her assumption is that you all have not learned a damn thing. Her assumption is that we have been asleep since 2002. Uh, we have to prove her wrong on that. Uh, and I would just note in regard to Hiroshima that when they talk in this new nuclear planning about building smaller, more usable nuclear weapons to put on submarines, 
They're talking about nuclear bombs almost the size of what was used on Hiroshima. You want to call, I mean, this is absolute delusional fantasy to call this usable nuclear weapons. They might as well, you know, make more edible nuclear weapons, add some creativity. I mean, th th this is madness. I'll answer your question. Um, you had asked, really, you, your concern is that once we have the door open to any just war, that then we bring in the unjust wars because both sides are going to lie uh, and try and be human beings are self justifying anyway, right? Psychologically. And so uh, you're afraid that it opens the door, right? At it. And so I do think our starting assumption, and this is the starting assumption of classic just war theory, although I'm not relying on those arguments, that war is wrong. So that should be the starting assumption, American public. War is wrong. It's the intentional, large-scale killing of other people. And then you make the case, pointing to all the people who are threatened by this unjust aggressor, of why you have to do it. I wish our Constitution was actually about just war, because then it would require that kind of speech. I do encourage people to look at President George H.W. Bush's speech on YouTube, January 17, 1991, I think. It is one of the best articulations of a just war. It's the best one that I've ever seen. And uh, I think he was genuinely concerned about that. And I know that the Iraqi people absolutely had a right and are generally fully grateful that their political community uh, was restored. So, but look at that, he goes through a great argument. All right, we have just a few more minutes left. Um, and I have a final question for the two of you. So you're both philosophers. Um, and you actually have a lot of common ground, as I hear you, that if we had another person in your chair, there would be much more distance between you in terms of talking about the ethics of, uh, of going to war. So an example of this is that in Washington, D.C., when the Congress was talking about going to war with Iran, it was the US military that was on the same side as David Swatson trying to argue <laughs> that going to war with Iran was absolutely not a good idea and was wrong. And I am a person who also goes to Congress, and often I find myself arguing with congressional representatives and senators alongside a military person for a similar policy of restraint because it's often civilian leaders who don't understand war and who are much more eager and think that there's all these military solutions when it's our generals in the military that are often saying about Iraq and Afghanistan, there is no military solution. Um, and telling Congress, please invest in diplomacy, please invest in other ways of addressing conflict. Now just today, uh, the Trump administration argued about cutting the State Department even more. The top diplomats in the country are resigning or being fired. Um, so all of the work that we've done over the last 15 years, peace activists with the military trying to argue to Congress that we need a better State Department, we need more diplomats, we need negotiators who can solve these global problems that have no military solution, and the military themselves knows that. What, what's the common ground between the two of you? Can, I mean, can you see it in listening to each other tonight? And can you think of anything concrete the two of you could do that might um, build on your common ground? I say common ground is we both would love to see a world in which there's no war. Uh, the major difference between us is he thinks that's attainable, and I just think based maybe it's a more classical conservative view of human nature and the fall of man, I think that's never attainable. I do think we can greatly decrease the incidence of war by holding ourselves accountable to only engaging in just wars. Um, so I, I see that's an area of commonality. Well, commonality, we both want to see less spending on defense for some of the reasons you said, right? If we, the, the less we have in terms of uh, economic involvement and diplomatic involvement, the more likely we're going to have to use the, the military. And um, contrary to pro popular belief, people don't like going away from their families for nine to 15 months at a time. Uh, my son got married, had less than five weeks. Right? 
before you know, he went off to Syria. So we, we share the desire to, to uh, do we wish there were less war or no war? I just don't think it's human nature that we'll ever have no war, and so that we must be prepared to defend our people, the most fundamental thing a government does. Uh, great question uh, for Common Ground Coffee Shop or wherever we are here. Uh, speaking of war escalation, uh, you know, initial reports of the U.S. killing Russians in Syria, uh, it reliance on yet more restraint uh, from the Russians, I certainly hope. You know, I opened with the fact that we both want to cut military spending. Uh, let's put a number on that. Let's work for that. Let's recognize that it's not a question of the size of the government, but the fact that they keep moving the money from everything else to the military, and we need a popular movement with as many disparate and uncomfortably large coalition voices in it to demand that the money move in the other direction. We can work on that together. I will, you know, I, I can't join you in promoting the wars you think are just, but if you're willing to join me in opposing the ones you think are unjust, that I would like to work with you on. Um, I think, however, that there's much more distance between the two of us than there's been between myself and every other previous debate partner I've managed to get on a stage with me, and I am appreciative of that. It's a good thing. It's good for my education to, to, to face someone who's articulate, informed, passionate, and that far away from where I am. But this is what I wanted. This is what I've been trying to get, is this kind of a debate. Um, I, I do agree that it is very often civilians uh, who are pushing the military on war. And I think when you see an entire stadium of people stand up and cheer for unity and peace and hope, except for Vice President Mike Pence and his wife and President Abe from Japan, the three of them sitting there on their large rears glaring nastily about them. You know, this is, this is the face of wanting war. Uh, and, and this is the next person that needs to be impeached. Uh, I, I, do, I, I do think that this, there is no military solution, there is no military solution, has now been said so much that it's like an unheard chant. Uh, because they take all the funding out of any possible non-military solution, they proceed with nothing but military alternatives, and yet they say in every speech, we know there's no military solution. Well, stop saying it. Start acting on it. All right. A very passionate discussion. Thank you very much. Providing a space. Be well.